If you have your Bibles with you this morning, please open them to the book of Psalms, Psalm 19, Psalm 19, verses 7 through 11. Psalm 19, verses 7 through 11. The Sufficiency of Scripture. Psalm 19, I'm going to read uh, 7 through verse 11. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings from the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, in keeping them there is great reward. Every single person living on this planet, or who has ever lived or will ever live on this planet, has a view of the world in which they live that is shaped by their most fundamental beliefs and assumptions about the universe in which they live. And these fundamental beliefs and assumptions that we have about the world in which we live serve as the foundation for how we live and conduct ourselves in this world. So obviously what we're talking about this morning is a person's worldview. And a person's particular worldview is is developed over the course of their lifetime by such factors. And the most important factor, of course, is family. Also, friends have an influence on our worldview. Definitely, the culture and communities we live in, uh, religion or lack of religion, education, and a whole host of various life experiences that tend to solidify what we believe and how we live. And as I said at the beginning, each one of us has a world view. And that world view reflects how you will answer big questions in life. Some of those fundamental questions of human existence such as, where did I come from? How do you answer that question? Why are we here? Why are you here on this earth? How do you answer that question? What's my purpose in life? What happens when we die? Is there an afterlife and does God even exist? Are we alone in this universe? And what is the nature of truth? Is, is there an absolute truth or is truth relative? Your worldview will also be reflected in how you answer moral, ethical, and political questions of the time in which you live. Questions like, what do I believe about abortion? Well, how you answer these questions tells you your worldview. What do I believe about the death penalty? What do I believe about same-sex marriages? What do I believe about environmental issues like global warming or overpopulation? Maybe your worldview says, I don't believe in global warming and I certainly don't believe in overpopulation. What are, what are your views on education? Who has the primary responsibility to educate your children? Everybody has a thought on these things. Every single person does. It's, it's part of their worldview. What form of government do you support? Do you support a monarchy? Do you support a democracy, an oligarchy, an authoritarian government, or totalitarianism? What's your economic system of choice? Is it capitalism? Or is it socialism? Communism? How you answer these questions, and everybody has an answer about these questions. Your answer may be, I don't know for sure. And that's your worldview. However you answer these kinds of questions comes from these ideas in your mind that you believe to be true. You know, a lot of people go through life and they believe certain things and they never ever question what they believe. They just believe what they believe. Then there's people who are the exact opposite who want to question everything to make sure that what they believe is as right as it can be. 
And then there's those who believe everything they are told, and so their worldview is ever-changing and all over the place. And as I said, your worldview does grow. It does change from time to time. And if you say today, I don't believe in anything, well, that's your worldview. But the big question for us today is, can a person really have a correct worldview? You know, are there wrong worldviews and right worldviews, or is there just one right worldview and the rest are wrong? Or is that even a proper question? Can you have a correct view at all? Is that even possible? As a Christian, I believe that a biblical worldview is correct. And I did not say that a biblical worldview is just correct for me. And your worldview can be whatever you want it to be, and that's good too. That's, that's the world we live in, to a certain extent. You can believe what you want, let me believe what I want. I didn't say that. I believe that the biblical worldview is not only correct for me, but I believe that it is the only correct worldview. Period. Period. Because the Bible is the only divinely inspired word that we have from God. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21 tell us this. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So the Bible is the Word of God. But we know that there are human authors. Moses wrote the first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch. Uh, many of the New Testament epistles are written by the Apostle Paul. You, you get the idea. There are human authors. But what Peter tells us in the text I've just read in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, that what these men wrote was inspired by God. They were carried along by the Holy Spirit as they wrote. So what we have in the Bible then is the very Word of God. The Bible is divine rather than human in origin. And God's the creator of all life and the universe. God is sovereign over all things according to the Bible. And so what God has to say in His Word is truth. And it should be the basis of a Christian's worldview. Now, you can't expect lost people to have the biblical worldview that a Christian would have. But overall, culturally speaking, in this country at one time, the biblical worldview kind of held sway. That has all changed now. Jesus says in John 17, 17, Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. So what else am I going to put my faith in other than the word of God? What, what am I going to build my view and understanding of the world in if it's not the word of God, since the word of God is truth? Since the word of God is truth, therefore it is sufficient, completely sufficient for my faith, and for my conduct in this world. And since the Word of God is true, the Word of God alone should be the standard by which I measure all other truth claims, all other worldviews. Should be measured by the Word of God. Therefore, as a Christian, your worldview must be a view of the world that is informed biblically. That means for you and me that 
The Bible should be is completely sufficient for my faith and practice in this world. What I believe and how I live. The Bible should inform that from cover to cover. That's number one. Number two is the Bible should be the standard by which I measure all other truth claims. So when somebody comes down the road and has this truth claim, you look at the Word of God and what does the Word of God say? If what the Word of God says, let me say it this way, if what some human philosopher, what some human activist comes along and says is truth, if it contradicts Scripture, then you reject that worldview because it's wrong. It's wrong. If you want to do the will of God in your life, then you have a biblical worldview. You live out your faith and you measure other truth claims by the Word of God and make judgments accordingly. It's very simple. But it's awful hard for some folks to do because they're afraid of the world. They don't want the world as an enemy. And so they compromise their truth claims in order to accommodate a worldview that is wrong. In our text for today in Psalm 19, verses 7 through 11, God has given us what has been described as the most concise and direct treatment of the sufficiency of Scripture in all of the Bible. In verses 7 through 9, there are six statements made about the Word of God that includes the phrase, of the Lord. This indicates that what is being taught in this psalm comes from the Lord Himself. And this ensures the absolute sufficiency of His Word. We're going to break these down over a few weeks. And we're going to begin with verse 7 today. Just half of verse 7. How's that? Just half a verse today. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. So you can divide this up in three parts. The law of the Lord, number one, is perfect, number two, reviving the soul, number three, which is the result. This is the sufficiency of Scripture. The sufficiency of Scripture means that the Word of God, the Word of God alone, is necessary, and all that is necessary for a life of faith and faithful living in this world, and becomes a standard of measure by which we measure other truth claims. So let's look at that first section, the law of the Lord. Notice that the Lord is all capital letters. It's Yahweh. It's the covenant name of God. The Hebrew word trans translated law is Torah. You've heard that before, Torah. And the word Torah itself means direction or instruction. So it is the instruction of the Lord. The law of God. And as it's used in this verse, it indicates a divine direction. Divine instruction. Concerning your creed in life, what you believe. See that world view there? It also speaks to our character, number two, what we are, and number three, our conduct in this life, what we do. So the law of the Lord, the Torah of the Lord, gives divine direction, divine instruction concerning what we believe, who we are, what we are, and what we do. Our creed, our character, and our conduct. God's Word is true doctrine. The word doctrine means teaching. The Word of God is true teaching for everyday life. So where do you look for guidance in living? You heard of the, what is it, the Enneagram, Enneagram, whatever that thing is called. It's basically uh, fortune telling for Christians. I've seen Christian spiritual cards that are a replacement for tarot cards. Do you read a horoscope? How many of you take a fortune cookie seriously? 
Don't raise your hand. Don't do that to yourself. <laughs> but where do you look for guidance in life? Oprah Winfrey, Dr. Phil, whoever the most recent gurus of top television are today, The View. Where do you turn to for, for truth? Why would you turn, if you're a Christian, why would you turn to anything else other than the Word of God? So it is, this takes us to the second part, it's perfect. The law of the Lord, the instruction of God, the Torah of the Lord is perfect. That word perfect means complete or whole. So the law of the Lord is completely sufficient. It's, it's full to the max. It's, it's whole. It's sufficient for your faith. What do you do about your faith? Where do you turn to about matters of faith? Do you turn to the Word of God? Or do you turn to other things? People that don't look for direction in life from the Word of God often don't look to God for spiritual things either. And really you don't separate the spiritual from, from the life. It's, it's all one thing. Whereas we see that the Word of God is perfect, it's complete, it, it's, it's um, sufficient for your life and for your faith. Because point number three, the result is that it revives the soul. If we look at other things to help us in our faith and to help us in our living, and, and not the Word of God, we're not reviving our soul at all. We're creating a drought, a thirst in our soul. We're hurting our soul. We're damaging our soul. Now the King James has converting the soul. The word, the Hebrew word, whether it's translated converting or reviving, means simply to return or to restore. When you are broken in life, when you are broken in spirit, where do you go to be repaired, to be restored, to be fixed? So often we turn to the world. But the Word of God and the Word of God alone restores the soul. The saving power of the Word we understand. We all, if we're saved, we, we all claim to be saved based on what the Word of God teaches. So you would say that if you're saved, the Bible is sufficient for you to gain a knowledge of what it means to be saved. It tells you of your sin, and it tells you of your Savior. You believe that the Bible is sufficient for salvation. Then why wouldn't you believe that it's sufficient for sanctification? You see, the pursuit of holiness should be the Christian's primary goal. That's what satisfies the soul. When we compromise with the world, we do damage to our soul. The world is an enemy. And it seeks to make us an enemy of God. And that's exactly what happens when we do embrace a worldview that is not biblical. We become an enemy of God. Now, I'll get to that as we begin to close. The Bible is sufficient to save you. The Bible is sufficient to sanctify you. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. In Christ you are new. In Christ you are renewed every day. But only as you turn to the Word of God. Because the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The Word is sufficient to save. The Word is sufficient to sanctify. It renews the soul every day in Christ. We read in 2 Corinthians 4, 16, Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. Christian, if you are indeed a Christian, you live at a particular age 
in church history, our day, when evangelicals, those who claim to be saved, have faith in Christ, you live in a time when evangelicals no longer believe that the word is sufficient for faith and practice. It's just not enough. It's not sufficient. You must supplement it with what we have learned from human philosophy, science, sociology, psychology, even claiming that the church has something to learn from the many successes in the business world as it applies to church growth. Because the Bible is not enough. The Bible is not sufficient. But it's interesting because these same evangelicals claim that the Bible is the inspired Word of God. Oh, it came from God. Definitely came from God. But when it comes to the sufficiency of Scripture, they balk. But when you read the Bible, and that's the problem, most don't. When you read the Bible, the Bible claims for itself to be completely sufficient for faith and life of those who follow Christ. Why not everybody? Well, if everybody was saved, it would. But the unbeliever doesn't believe the Word of God is the Word of God. It's foolishness to them, the Scripture says. But as a Christian, when you read the Bible and you read passages like Psalm 19, 7 through 11, and there it is leaping up off the page that the Word of God is sufficient for you. Sufficient for your faith and sufficient for your practice and becomes the only standard by which you can measure other truth claims. And we know that the vast, I don't know if I can say vast majority, but it seems to be a lot of evangelicals today who are, who are jumping on board with, with all of this social decay, this transgender and LBGTQ plus uh, the same-sex marriage, gender fluidity, critical race. There you see Christians just in droves embracing this worldview. But if they'd read their Bible, they could have compared what the truth is to that garbage and would reject it. Because it's contrary to Scripture. The Bible claims to be sufficient. So what's the problem in the evangelical world? Well, as we close, let me say this. To deny the sufficiency of the Word of God is to deny the very teachings of God Himself. And to deny the very teachings of God Himself, then, is to deny the author, God. To deny the Word of God is to deny God. You can give lip service to the Bible being divinely inspired all day long. But if you're always compromising the truth for a lie, then you don't believe the Word of God is the Word of God, and you don't believe that God is God. Because if you believe the Word of God, that means you believe God. So the greatest problem in the church right now is that while so many Christians affirm the Bible as the inerrant and infallible Word of God, their worldview is almost exclusively secular. And that means that Christians have no idea what the Bible even teaches. And when the Bible is not the foundation of your thinking, then the thinking of a secular and godless world will fill that void. And so in developing a biblical worldview, well, a biblical worldview begins with this conviction. It's a fundamental conviction. And that conviction is this. That God Himself has spoken in His Word. And if that is your conviction, if you believe that the Word of God is from God, that He spoke this Word then the Word will shape your life. 
It will shape your thinking. It will develop your faith. It will be the standard by which you me measure all other truth claims and reject those that don't measure up to God's Word. But we see the exact opposite today. We see people claiming that this is the Word of God. This is the inerrant and infallible Word of God. And yet, I'm going to buy into all this cultural garbage that is being shoved down our throats. You don't have a biblical worldview because you don't believe the Word of God. Just think about it. If you don't have an absolute standard to measure truth by, how do you know what's true? What you find yourself doing is being like the third person that I mentioned in, who have a, a particular worldview that they're always changing their mind about what they believe because the culture is always changing what truth is. There has to be a standard of measure of absolute truth or there can be no truth. And God is the standard of that measure because God is the Creator and God is God and God is holy and He has given us His Word and the truth is settled. So everything that you as a Christian encounter in life that must pass through the filter of your mind, you're going to have to measure everything by the standard of the Word of God and reject everything that contradicts the Word. If you don't, are you even really a Christian? Because to reject the Word is to reject the author. Someone said, unless this conviction dominates our perspective on all of life, we cannot legitimately claim to have embraced a biblical worldview. So, what is your worldview? How do you answer those those questions that I that I posed this morning? The ultimate questions of life: Why am I here? Is there a God? Is there absolute truth? What about the moral? The the Cultural. What about the political questions? What about abortion? What about uh, same-sex marriage? What about the economy? What about politics? And the Bible informs our minds and it's sufficient to cover everything we face in life. But if, you, if your fur bristles when I say the Bible is sufficient to answer everything in life, you think, well, I don't know about that. And that tells you where your worldview is. And it's a danger sign because what it is saying is that I don't know if the Word of God is the Word of God. I don't know if the Word of God is sufficient for everything. So, what does your worldview reveal about who you love? Does your worldview reveal that you love Christ? Or does your worldview reveal that you love the world? Jesus says in John 14, 15, I quote this a lot, If you love me, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So if you don't keep his commandments, you don't love Jesus. And that puts a whole new light on the sufficiency of Scripture in my worldview doesn't. Because if my worldview doesn't embrace the Bible as the inerrant, infallible, sufficient Word of God for my faith and practice and the standard by which I measure other truth claims, do I love Jesus? How can you love Jesus if you think His Word is not sufficient? In Matthew 6, 24, Jesus tells us that we cannot serve two masters. You will love one and you'll hate the other. So that means you can't be a worldly Christian. There's no such thing as a worldly Christian. 
Because you can't love Jesus and the world. Because James 4.4 4 says that friendship with the world makes us an enemy of God. When Jesus walked this earth, He didn't sugarcoat anything. He spoke the truth in no uncertain terms. And He told people the high cost of following Him. You might not have ever thought in your life that what you believe about things, like a worldview, would have any eternal Implications, but it does, doesn't it? Because your worldview tells you about who you love most. So, as a Christian, the high cost of following Christ for you in the world will cause you to make judgments all day long about what is godly and what isn't what is right and what is wrong, and you have to act on those judgments. And acting on truth in a culture that loves sin like ours does won't win you many friends in life. And so what you have to do is decide who you're going to follow. I'm going to follow Jesus, and so I'm going to reject all of this garbage that is being shoved down our throats today. That doesn't mean you have to be a bully or be arrogant, because you have to speak the truth in love. But you must reject the things God rejects that are wrong because the Word of God is your standard of measure of truth. Yes, there is absolute truth and it's the Word of God. Take it or you leave it. There's no, there's no neutral. There's no hiding. There's no blending in. There's no carnal Christians. It's all or nothing. It's all or nothing. It's always been all or nothing. So we, we finish the sermon and, and some of us will go home and we'll think through these things. Some of us will just, you know, I don't want to deal with it. Uh, it's too high a cost. I can't handle it right now. Whatever. But the day comes when we stand before God. And what are you going to do then? You can't hide. There's no place to hide behind Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And so your worldview is a matter of love. Because it reveals who you love and who you don't. What does your worldview reveal about you? God, help us all to stand together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the absolute truth of your word. And Father, we pray that we would grow in our understanding of your word and our love for you and our love for the lost and our love for our brothers and sisters in Christ. But God, that we would not compromise your precious word for the sake of getting along unscathed in this world. History, God, your story proves it over and over again. We've got to stand for truth. I will all be swept away in judgment. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hymn number 317. <clears throat>